and you know there have been some high profile cases such as in Australia there was two Ernie Barry in 2011 who was a worker or a preacher in the group and uh, Chris Chandler in 2014 who was also a preacher and a worker or what we call a worker in the group and it also must be said that these two operated together um, and you know to me this this fact that they were charged separately and, and that also they hung out together is like is like an indicator of the endemic nature of the abuse in the group. Laura Conti, thanks so much for coming back on to Talk Beliefs all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Now, last time on the show, you spoke about growing up fourth generation of a secretive Christian sect known as the Two by Twos and your eventual escape. You got back in touch because you wanted to alert our audience to a cause very dear to your heart, the redress scheme of the Australian Royal Commission, a scheme that investigates allegations of harm within groups like the two by twos, urging for acknowledgement and compensation. Welcome back, Laura. Our last interview um, sparked quite a few interesting remarks in the comments section, including uh, a few arguments amongst members of your former group. Yeah, thank you for having me back. And did you know, just as a bit of a side note, I discovered not long after our last show that I'm actually a fifth generation from the two by twos or the truth. So there's another like interesting learning for you out of your uh, show. Anyway, lots happened since then, but then so much has also stayed the same. So yeah, so the, the comments on the video um, and also on my own social media and other media articles were very interesting and the source of a lot of analysis for me because they happened within, you know, within within hours, um, on the backlash on, on the last one. So yeah, I've learned a lot. I've got a lot of backlash and it's sort of come in three different forms, which um, has been very interesting. Um, you know, people who've left, who disagreed with the way that the way I left and who disagreed that some of the things I've experienced were things that happened. So that was interesting. There was backlash from people who were still inside, who were quite sure that the things I was saying were not true or not because, you know, they're just not their experiences of the group. And then there were people who I already knew about who would backlash, you know, so they were no surprise to me at all. So yeah, there were three different sources. Um, and, you know, I don't want to, but, you know, also gloss over the fact there were lots of supporters as well. So I'm always grateful to have people who also said these are also my experiences of the group. So that was good as well. But anyway, I've spent a lot of time unpacking the motivations of the people um, involved in some of the backlash. Um, and it really comes down to lots of different hierarchies within the group, which I think exists in most of the, the cultish groups. Um, and it really matters what your gender and sexuality is. It matters your economic status and your social background. Like I think a lot of the backlash came about as a result of my experiences being different to others and other people not being able to kind of have a bit of a look and think, oh, m maybe my experiences are not the only way to experience the group. Also, I think, which we'll get to later, um, I think if you had experiences of sexual assault and um, CSA, in the group, I think your experiences of leaving the group are quite different to people who've left after theological differences, for instance. Well, before we get into the details of the Royal Commission and your own claim against the two-by-twos, can you just remind people of what this Christian sect is all about? Yeah, so the two-by-twos, which are also known as the truth, um, they're a very conservative fundamentalist Christian sect in a nutshell. Um, they're very secretive. They claim to have no name, which is why you know, like we refer to them as the two-by-twos or the truth, because they actually claim not to have a name. They claim they have no earthly leadership, no earthly buildings. And the reality is those things do exist. Um, we're just sort of gaslit and lied to and made to believe that they don't exist. Um, the truth is very, very secretive about its origins. Um, it claims that it has, it goes all the way back to Jesus when in fact it was started in the 1800s, the late 1800s in Ireland. And followers are not openly told the truth of the group and, and the fact that it was founded by a man named William Irvine. Um, I think since the internet came into being, there is more and more people who've been aware that, the, that perhaps the origins are there, but there's a whole lot of other spin that happens behind the scenes about, you know, it lay dormant until William Irvine came along, for instance. Um, there's a lot of kind of gaslighting behaviour and storytelling that happens. Um, truth followers or friends, as they're referred to internally, um, and they're a very tight-knit group with very strict, which I've alluded to previously, very strict gender and sexuality beliefs. Um which is also not uncommon for a lot of fundamentalist groups. Um, the group has a lot of unique cultural behaviours, um, very tight controlling behaviours on particularly women and children's appearance, 
um, that women, you know, are to wear very certain clothes, not to wear trousers, for instance, because they're not to wear clothing that can be seen to be men's clothing, um, to not cut their hair or wear jewellery other than a very simple watch or, or wedding band. And there's a certain look that you'll see um, with women and, and girls um, from the group. Usually they wear their hair in a very sort of specific bun and girls with a braid. And to be honest, there's a lot of similarities with the ideology and the culture to groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Latter-day Saints and the Plymouth Brethren. And in fact, in Australia, sometimes the two by twos or the truth friends are mistaken for Plymouth Brethren because there is a lot of similarities in their appearances and also in the ways that our communities tend to congregate together, especially some of the regional and rural communities. So there's a lot of similarities there. Um, there is also a lot of differences in doctrine, for instance, but there's also some similarities. Um, the truth tends not to because it's very secretive to have any uh, a lot of written material other than a very sort of standard hymn book and a King James Bible. So getting hold of written doctrine and sort of interrogating and asking questions about exactly what the group believes is very, very difficult. Um, we tend to, we tended, especially when I was a child, to, have, to really not have access to a lot of information outside of the community. That has increased now with uh, the internet and a lot of people do have the internet. But when I was growing up, you know, we weren't allowed to have TV, we were allowed to have radio, to listen to pop music, to have a lot of fraternisation outside of our communities and families. Um, yeah, so getting information, especially as a survivor of um, abuse inside the group, is, is very uh, difficult to have to get them to court or to get people to court because there's no written doctrine about what they believe. Um, and yeah, I mean, they also refuse to register as an entity. For instance, in Australia, they're not a registered church or a registered organisation or a registered charity. Um, they take all of the donations in cash and nobody really formally knows where the cash goes. I mean, I've got ideas about where it goes into a wealthy particular family's bank accounts and, and into their businesses, but it's not formally recorded anywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll get into it in a moment, but it, the, the fact that they don't have a registered entity and, and I believe the same across other um, Western countries as well is, means that they're not registered for tax, they're not registered as a charity, then there's no employee records, there's no volunteer records. Um, it, it's very difficult to hold the group to account without any written doctrine, without a formal registered name and no entity. It's a very, um, a very shady, very slippery um, set of circumstances that the group operates within. And it's interesting, Laura, that they call themselves the truth, because if I had a penny for every time I heard a group call themselves that, I mean, even the Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. call themselves the truth. So it's their own they perspective do. of the truth, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, it's almost like if you say something enough, it's true, you know, which is a bit like what these groups use. They say, oh, you know, we're the one true way and we're the truth and we're the, the chosen people. You know, there's a lot of similar language um, that these groups use. And it's like if you say it enough, maybe everyone will believe you, you know. Laura, can you give us an overview on the history of abuse within the two by twos? Yeah, there is very sadly a long, long history of, of not just sexual abuse, but also family violence and child sexual abuse and coercive behavior, you know, coercive behavior on all, all kinds of spectrums, you know, abuse is very embedded within the group. Um, although it must be said that some people recognize the abuse more than others and some people um, understand the coercive behaviors more than others. There's a lot of people who pretend it doesn't exist or, or claim that it doesn't exist because their idea of what abuse is is not fully formed. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, I want to be really blunt about that. There is a very long history of abuse inside the group and there is a tendency uh, for people involved in the group to believe that that the abuse allegations have only just come to light in the group and that like it never existed before before the last decade or in the case of the US at the moment, didn't it just came to light in the last couple of months. And that is just not true. The group has a very long history of abuses and covering up abuses. You know, in my own kind of extended family, abuses have been raised since at least the 70s and in my own life since the 90s and early 2000s. This has been around a very, very long time, much before me and my time. And the group has a long history of protecting abusers. Its doctrine encourages followers to fear the outside world, to fear authorities, which again, fundamentalist groups are very good at doing, is making people fear people outside the group, that they're not trustworthy. So that enables a constant cover-up culture. It enables a culture where victims and survivors feel like they're not safe to go to things like law enforcement, to, um, to get help from psychologists and psychiatrists and mental health professionals and doctors, for instance, which means that perpetrators are never held to account and they're never removed from the group. You know, and this is not just CSA or sexual, or sexual assault. This is a whole range of coercive and abusive behaviours inside families and communities from things like spiritual abuse from, you know, um, 
um, controlling children um, right through to financial abuse and encouraging people to participate um, in public speaking and things that they don't feel comfortable with. You know, and, you know, there have been some high profile cases, such as in Australia, there was two Ernie Barry in 2011, who was a worker or a preacher in the group, and uh, Chris Chandler in 2014, who was also a preacher and a worker or what we call a worker in the group. And it also must be said that these two operated together. Um, and, you know, to me, this this fact that they were charged separately and, and that also they hung out together is like in, it's like an indicator of the endemic nature of the abuse in the group is that it, it it's very endemic like that in, as individuals are perpetrators but there's also potentially ways they could have been perpetrators together and been enabled um you know and there was a very big 60 minutes um episode here in australia profiling some women who were abused by an elder and um a, a, somebody um who was involved in a in you know my, my own family here in the group and you know we're not allowed to name them and we're often not allowed to talk all about them under australian law and you know many of these these men such as the people involved in the 60 minutes episode are still going to church they're still not being ex like excommunicated from the church they're still allowed to participate in things family you know enable them to come to groups that that I, I don't know that like the average church would allow anymore and because there are not registered registered entities and no formal policies and procedures that survivors can hold up and say you know you're a registered organization you, you can't be allowing convicted perpetrators in, in in the door there's no way to hold them to account no way to like put them on the outer in the organization um, things like um, child safety plans things like working with children checks like there's very little way to get evidence that these things exist and where they do exist where i've seen kind of evidence of them they're very poor quality and the group knows that they're poor quality and it doesn't matter because they're not an organization that's ever going to be audited because they've got no charity status and no organizational status so yeah yeah it's like multi-layered ways that perpetrators and um, leadership allow the behaviors to continue and and the truth and and its followers the two by twos genuinely believe that they report to god and that they're above earthly laws and and so they do all they can to smooth the way and look like they're doing the right thing but in reality all they're thinking about is well we report to god and god's in charge here we don't really need to worry too much about these earthly laws so you know it's not an easy it's not an easy thing to be a survivor of, of this group um, and there is a lot of pressure from both people inside and especially in Australia and increasingly in the US and Canada a lot of pressure from some people inside and a whole lot of pressure from people outside to try and get better responses to try and get perpetrators not to be allowed to, to, to come to church events for instance but you know, without a registered entity, without like formal leadership structures, without employment contracts and volunteer contracts, it's 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 very difficult to get change in the group, and um, and these people are protected. At the end of the day, it's it's not an it's not a matter of us, you know, making noise and and like our noise actually leading to change um, within the group. It's just not the way they work. <laughs> Well, you've made a submission to the Royal Commission regarding abuse within the 2 by 2 sect. But before we hear about that, can you explain to our audience what the Royal Commission does and how the redress scheme works? Yeah, so I've made a submission to the redress scheme because I wanted to access compensation. Um, and the redress scheme was set up here in Australia after the Royal Commission into institutional responses to childhood sexual assault in Australia. Um, and I know Renee Pickles has done some work on and mentioned it on your program as well um, because the JWs are a bit similar to what's happened with the truth or the two by twos in Australia. So it was set up in Australia because churches and all churches, no, mainstream ones as well as the fringe ones, did not respond appropriately when CSA was raised with them. So there's a whole history here in Australia and well, they've probably done the same thing overseas, but in Australia... Basically, they hired lawyers, they refused to take any accountability, they refused to pay fair compensation or to change any of the practices within a lot of the big churches. And so, um, yeah, this scheme was set up where you could make a submission for redress for abuse inside institutions. Um, and, yeah, basically the, what would happen is you would make a submission and the government um, solicitors would contact the church involved or the organisation involved and, and organise for a, a, a compensation according to a, a certain sort of structure and also an apology from that group if that was what you wanted. 
um, which all sounds great, <laughs> except there's some organisations and churches and the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, the Brethren and the Truth, or the two by twos, the three of them that I can just name off the top of my head, who have refused to sign up and participate. And um, one of the troubles with that is if your church or organisation does not sign up, you are not eligible for any form of compensation. So there are people out there like me from these fringish groups, these groups that are refusing to sign up, who've gone through a fairly torturous process of rehashing and recording our claims, um, sitting with solicitors, detailing, you know, in great lots of detail the things that have happened. And then our claim basically goes to an inbox and sits there. Um, and it's quite distressing and quite insulting um, to have done that and for it to go nowhere. And I mean, much like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they just the truth and the two by twos just refuse to sign up. Um, they don't have to, right? Like they don't have a charity status to protect, which is what the government was banking on. The government was banking that organisations would sign up or they would strip their charity status. Well, the, the truth and the two by twos don't care. They have no charity status. They have no registered organisation. They don't care. So, you know, there's no registered entity, there's no bank accounts, there's no ABN, there's no tax file number. So, like, for, for, for my group, they they don't care. They have no interest in signing up. Um, and, in fact, you know, I get I get emails from them when I try to push them from it saying, well, you know, we're just a, a loose group of like-minded Christians, you know. Um, I, you know, I'm not the leader of anything. I'm just, I'm just a, an organiser, you know. Like, they're just trying to gaslight at every opportunity so that they don't have to sign up to the scheme. Um, which, yeah, so it's, it's a fairly traumatic experience for those of us who've gone through the process of submitting and for it not to go anywhere. Laura, what is the nature of your claim against the two-by-twos? Uh, yeah, so my claim's um, multifaceted, actually, which makes it a bit more complex and potentially a little more distressing. And that is that... Um, is due to the fact that the the Regis scheme in Australia allowed you to raise claims against multiple people and multiple organisations because it's often a little discussed but very well researched fact that once you've experienced grooming and abuse in CSA of, of in fact abuse of most kinds that um, you're vulnerable to other abuses and, and it's my own experience that, um, that you can experience abuse from multiple places so and multiple organisations so I have multiple claims um, and so I have a claim against two organisations, in fact. And I won't be the only one there. You know, there will be others who have multiple claims because, unfortunately, that's the nature of trauma is once you've experienced trauma once, you experience it again in other places. It makes you vulnerable at the end of the day. So um, one of the groups I experienced um, abuse against, which is in my claim, is actually a medical facility or a medical organisation. And that organisation did sign up to the redress scheme. So in theory, that part of my claim could progress except that the way that the government set up the scheme, and again, I don't think that they fully thought through the fact that um, some organisations wouldn't sign up, is that you can only have one claim form. And if on that claim form you have a claim against multiple entities, they all need to progress together. If you have an entity that has not signed up on that form, your form cannot progress. So your claim just it cannot progress because that all, they all need to progress at the same time and be finalised at the same time. So for me, it's also distressing and upsetting because I have a claim against the two by twos, which means that my whole claim can't progress anywhere, even against an organisation which is not involved in the two by twos. So yeah, I, I mean, I keep being told by the government that I can remove the two by twos from my claim and my other claim will progress. But I just refuse to do that because in all honesty, the instance uh, that I have from the other facility is nothing compared to the abuse I experienced inside the two by twos or the grooming that I experienced inside that group. So I just refuse to do that. And also I think, you know, this is the government process. You created that process. I'm not going to like adapt my abuses to fit your process. I am going to be blunt and forthright about my abuses and you can deal. <laughs> you can you can see how it doesn't fit your process. So for me, the, the experiences I had inside the truth were far worse than the instances with the other organisation. And my claim essentially involves workers, or as I said previously, preachers, we call them workers, of the truth who were predators and came into our home in and behaved inappropriately. And because workers, um, you know, they don't have earthly buildings and they apparently don't have possessions, they stay in family homes. Um, and they live with families um, and they're always around children and they're always around vulnerable people. And it's a key part of their ideology to live in friends or two by two homes. Um, and two of the three involved in my claim are now dead. So for me to raise a civil claim, it's not possible. And even if they were alive, they 
in theory were penniless because that's one of the ideology things is that they don't have money. So a civil claim was never going to get me any compensation anyway. Uh, I mean, it is debatable whether they are penniless, but in, you know, for all practical purposes, they did not have bank accounts with money in them. So my only hope really is that the truth will sign up to the scheme in Australia and that they will do the right thing and that they will apologise to survivors like myself and that they'll take some kind of responsibility for the fact that their preachers are inside family homes and that they have access to children and vulnerable people and that they do not have the right policies and procedures and processes in place to deal with that. And I think for me, um, pe- I just don't think people talk enough about the financial cost and the implications of living with the trauma of coming from a group like this and experiencing abuses inside that group. You know, the cost of therapy, the cost of broken relationships and the physical toll on your body and your mind, you know, like I have chronic pain, um, which I know is because of the trauma I experienced. And I have a very large, very big family that I that is broken and traumatized as a result of what happened and will never be whole. So I think um I think we like I, I, I'm I'm a big advocate of people speaking loudly about the impacts of the trauma on them and asking for compensation because it costs money to survive and to recover from the things that have happened to us. Um, and yeah, it's very important to me that uh, that the redress scheme, um, it, that the truth signs up to the redress scheme and that there is a way for Australian survivors to get some kind of compensation. Well, we can't talk about this subject without going into the cases in America against the two by twos, because there are a lot of whistleblowers coming forward at the moment. Isn't that right? <laughs> Yeah, so right now in the US and also in Canada, there is a lot going on. Um, back in October in Oregon, there was a man called Dean Brewer, a, a, head, a head worker, in fact, called Dean Brewer. He was found dead in a hotel room, apparently not in suspicious circumstances. However, the mere fact that he was in a hotel room is just a bit odd to me because he was a head worker and as just been through, the workers live in our homes, they don't stay in hotel rooms. So um, yeah, I, I find that a little odd, although apparently it's not suspicious. So um, anyway, for some reason, he had money to be renting hotel rooms and he died in one. And then eight or nine months later, it gradually trickled out that in that hotel room was a laptop with some incriminating evidence of CSA and sexual assault. So workers in America tried to keep that very hush hush. But um, recently in the last month and a half through a Facebook group, some current members <clears throat> bravely shared a letter they had been asked not to share or discuss with anybody outlining allegations um, of abuse. And then the, as a result of that Facebook group and sharing of information that they very bravely shared, um, there there was a tsunami of both members who are currently inside, members who are thinking about leaving and ex-members who were just outraged that he had died um, and that immediately the laptop was not handed into police when the when information was found on it about the fact that the abuses were not um, followed up appropriately that it was all trying to be swept under the carpet and the few people who did know were being actively told to keep it a secret and not to talk about it outside the tight group of people who had access to the information so there was a, you know a, a, just a, a, a big groundswell of people just saying just outraged that information was being kept from them that was potentially going to impact them and their families. And, you know, what was a very small Facebook group grew by like a thousand people very, very quickly. Um, and so under pressure, the workers in, in America and in, in Canada started to act. And by act, I mean just like completely go into self-preservation mode. And there was this mad flurry of letters and communications that's come out of that. And, um, and more and more allegations have started surfacing. More and more people have started saying, oh, you know, I've had an inappropriate experience with this one or I've raised allegations previously and they've been swept under the carpet. And in the process of that, other other perpetrators have come to light and there is like quite a lot of um, noise and quite a lot of action in um, both America and in Canada at the moment. And in fact, there have been allegations um, of male workers um, perpetrating abuse against female workers. And, um, and in fact, Dean Brewer in the, in the US, in, um, in Oregon, the one who died in the hotel room has got allegations against him, um, I believe, by a female worker as well. So I know this is also not just an, an issue with um, power, but also within the workplace, you know, power within families and within um, staying in people's homes um, and abuse against minors, but also like a workplace case issue. Not that they're employees because they have no employee records. But, you know, it's a very multifaceted issue. 
and there's a lot of pressure at the moment in the US and Canada, much in the same way when the 60 Minutes episode came out, you know, here in Australia, asking where are the child safety procedures? Where are the policies? Where are the procedures? Where is the compensation for victims? And when I find it very sad to watch because I've seen this before, I've been watching it for the last decade here in Australia. It's also very frustrating because I can see that nothing's changing. <laughs> it's, not, it's not getting any better. Um, and in some of the letters, in fact, in, uh, coming out of the US and Canada, they're saying, oh, you know, we're looking to Australia for, for guidance about this because they're doing it so much better. And I'm just thinking, really? Like, no, they're not. Like, they're not doing it better at all. And so I have very little hope, really, that, that anything's changed, that anything is changing. Um, the, yeah, the, the, there's no registered entities in the US that I'm aware of. There's no tax being paid in the US. There's no employees. Again, like Australia, no auditable practices. So, you know, basically I, I, I'm watching people in the US and Canada having a lot of the feelings that we've had here in Australia probably for about the last decade, realising that the group isn't safe, realising that predators are being allowed to stay. I mean, this is the other thing coming out in this Facebook kind of conversations and the sharing of information is that they're allowing like alleged predators and also convicted predators back into the group again in a very short time frame they might say to them yeah, we just need you to lie lay for, lie low for a while and then they sort of reintegrate them back in again because they need the bums on the seats you know and so it's that uh, there's this idea that like we'll just it'll all just blow over and we can just kind of integrate these people back in again and you know it's yeah it's not safe it's really not safe and it's a little bit distressing to to be watching it happening all over again after having seen it happen here in australia laura this is a huge problem within the two by twos as well as other coercive groups so what do you want to say to any ex-members of the group and ones like it as to what can be done about this ongoing abuse yeah, it is a big problem, not just in, uh, in the group I come from, but from other coercive groups, like you mentioned. And firstly, these groups are not safe. It's not only sexual assault and child, child abuse. It's, it's family violence. It's coercive and controlling behaviours that are just rife across the whole spectrum. Um, it, the layers and the lack of safety are just never ending. And Anke Richter said something in the recent episode you filmed with her that really stuck with me, and that is that there's this sweet exterior, you know, that people tend to see from the outside, this sort of sweet kind of innocent exterior, and it hides a lot of the sinister behaviour. And she's right. You know, insiders project this sweet, placid, happy image, and they don't project the truth and tell the truth about it. About what's really happening so for people who've left i think it's our responsibility to keep talking and to keep telling our stories and to keep putting pressure on because if we don't these groups are able to keep pretending and playing a game and projecting that sweet innocent image and nothing changes and so and i know that's hard like that is hard for, for leavers to do like we're already traumatized people we've been harmed the last thing we often feel like is exposing ourselves on YouTube and TikTok, for instance. But, it, you know, it's a choice I think if you can, you need to make, and that's the one I make. And that is because staying silent doesn't change anything. And, and I know that's not a decision people should have to make and it's awful. But And I'm conscious that I'm very privileged that I can do that because I have the personality to be able to do it. But I do think we have a responsibility to keep pushing and to keep telling stories. And then I think also for insiders of the groups and especially the two by twos and the truth, I think there's realistically, I know there's not a lot they can do. The group is unsafe and nothing they do and nothing you want to do will make it safe. The only way it can be made safe is if it no longer exists. That's the harsh reality. Trying to change it from the inside is it's, it's futile. It's pointless. It's built on a foundation of lies and of power and control and abuse of women and children and vulnerable people. And it just needs to be burnt to the ground. That's the blunt reality. And realistically, I know that not everybody can leave. You know, people have their whole lives tied up in groups like the one that I came from. Their friendships, their families, their employment, their homes, you know, often things like their family farms. So not everyone can just walk out the way that I did. And so they need to survive, right? And ho hopefully maybe one day slowly extract themselves. Maybe, maybe it takes decades and maybe they can never fully leave. But I think it's about encouraging people to build contacts on the outside, to start learning about the coercive behaviours and how those things might be impacting your children and your grandchildren and your friends and your family. And then start building safety moats around them. Stop giving workers access to your home and your car, for instance, and stop donating them cash. They do not need your cash. They do not need your home. They do not need your car. 
So, um, and, and then when people are accused and, 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 and even convicted of CSA and sexual assault, stop, stop sheltering them, <laughs> like stop allowing them back into your church, like stop it, stop, yeah. I, I, there is a lot, of, um, a lot of sheltering these people that just that should stop. Um, but honestly, I think, um, yeah, unless they're paying compensation to survivors, unless they're registering entities, that's the barometer for me. They're not, they're not engaged in change. And I think the reality is the group needs to be put to the ground. It's not able to be changed. Um, there's no tax file numbers. There's no employee records. There's no entity. The change is not going to happen. I think, um, yeah, we just need to try and help people leave at the end of the day. Well, it's been great having you back on the show, Laura, and I just want to thank you for bringing awareness to this continuing problem. I will leave links to your social media as well as websites and groups involved in the redress scheme in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Laura, for coming back on to Talk Beliefs. Thanks so much for having me. And um, like I said last time, it matters a whole lot that there is space like yours for people to tell their stories and for people um, to raise awareness and to have these conversations. So thank you. Um, it means a great deal.